This is a session actually on valuing non-health outcomes, and we will hear from four speakers and then open the session to discussion. So we will hear first from Dale Whittington. Uh, two's fine. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are now uh, turning to the valuation of uh, non-health outcomes, and I'm just going to open uh, this session with a few um, uh, introductory remarks. Um, for uh, cost-benefit analysts and people working in this field, um, most of the field is about non-health outcomes. This is not a minor uh, detail here. Um, we have, uh, in the field, spent uh, decades uh, measuring the costs and benefits of transportation, power supply, educational programs, crime prevention, national parks, reservoirs, all kinds of things. So, so this is um, where most of our uh, work in the field um, uh, has been. And from an investment um, point of view, I think our challenge now is to compare something like uh, development uh, project one here, which say might be vaccination or emergency medical services with something like um, a development project two, like roads or agricultural ex extensions. And um, so uh, actually Dean talked about um, this uh, a while ago about um, the lack of transparency in uh, doing uh, uh, sector analysis, intersector analysis in health. And that's not unique to health. Um, all of the sector economists don't want their projects compared to other sectors. They might lose their, their budget. But um, that's not the world that households and policymakers uh, live in. They make cross-sectoral uh, comparisons. And um, I, I was uh, uh, just back from Port-au-Prince with, with uh, Brad, uh, where we did uh, uh, Copenhagen Consensus cross-sectoral comparisons with several hundred interventions across many uh, different sectors. Um, and the Copenhagen Consensus team had uh, two hours with the president of Haiti, the finance minister, uh, minister of planning, and all their staffs. So the decision makers actually want this. This is a natural um, discourse for senior policymakers making cross-sectoral decisions. So while the, the health sector people and the transportation sector people, there's a real sector bias to not having your work compared. That's not the world that uh, other people, uh, in, uh, senior people in, the, in government live in. So I think there is an audience for this work. Um, and I, so first point I would make is, you know, I'm uh, like uh, David, I'm also a cautious optimist. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, as you move from cost-effective analysis to cost-benefit analysis, you m might not win every time. I mean, the politics of budget allocation are really tough. <laughs> um, but um, one big win might make it all worthwhile. For Rico ask, um, you know, let's do a cost-benefit analysis of a cost-benefit analysis this morning, right? What would that look like? And I, I, I don't think you have to have too many big wins um, to, to make this worthwhile. I think in the U.S. we've had a big win on the cost-benefit analysis of re removing lead from gasoline. We've done a lot of cost-benefit analysis. That's worth billions. Um, and I think in Haiti, um, the Copenhagen consensus may have had a big win. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of attention being paid now to wheat fortification. Well, if that's the only thing that comes out of this cross-sectoral exercise is that children in Haiti you know, have the wheat fortified or get micronutrients, that's a big win. And it might not have happened. Uh, I mean, the president didn't invite the team in to talk about qualities and dallies. I mean, they, they invited a, a team in to talk about costs and benefits, right? And that was the world in which they were uh, most comfortable. Um, my, my second point is that um, when we um, move to this cross-sectoral uh, comparison, um, uh, the world gets a lot more complicated. My first slide was much too simple. Um, uh, we're going to have development projects, uh, uh, I like three water and sanitation projects, where we have health outcomes and we have non-health outcomes, like time savings. And is that a health project? I mean, the water people think it's a health project, but it's not only a health project. I mean, it has 
other economic benefits. So we've got to compare health projects um, or water projects against um, well the micronutrients in the wheat fort fortification. They lead to health outcomes initially, but then they lead to long-term productivity gains. If you if you leave off the uh, non-health outcomes, as Richard was saying this morning, you, you miss a lot of the story. So we, we really have a much more complex um, uh, set of investments to evaluate. And the reality is we're using both expert opinion to evaluate some of these benefits and we're using, as um, Jim said, we're, we're doing a lot more work with um, trying to measure individual preferences. And when we do that, we have complex projects, complex sequencing projects. Um, we have a, a, a big risk of um, double counting uh, benefits. So we, um, my message here is we really do need a, a rigorous conceptual framework to know what to include and what not to include. So if you fell asleep during Trudy's qu equations, that's too bad because they're really important. They're, re they're really important here in terms of keeping track of really what to include uh, in costs and, and benefits once we get these kind of complex. So we really do need a theoretical uh, framework uh, uh, to do this. Um, my my uh, next point actually um, has to do uh, with the heterogeneity of individual preferences. And I just want to show you uh, one um, uh, study that uh, um, actually I didn't do. It was a, a Joe Cook and a team. Um, actually, Joe Cook's here at the University of Washington. Um, uh, but um, I, it was a study um, trying to estimate the value of time for about um, 380 households in rural uh, Kenya. So one of the uh, benefits, uh, one of the non-health outcomes of improved water projects are time savings. So the question is, how um, would we value those time savings? So we use the same kind of uh, methodology here that uh, Trudy described that she used and that Jim described that, she, that uh, uh, he used. And so there was a simple uh, question that was posed to uh, households. They had their existing water source and they were asked a question about uh, two hypothetical water sources and which would they choose? So they could stick with their current water source or uh, they could go to a new water point A, which had a, a certain time to walk and a certain cost, uh, Kenyan shillings per jerry can, or they could go to a new water point B. So if you look at those two, um, it's clear that if they moved, um, they ought to go to B. And that's kind of a trick question. So we're, we're actually trying to test to see how um, attentive people are to these choices to make sure that they're not telling us that they um, would choose um, A over B. But um, out of this data set um, on hypothetical choices on water uh, points, um, uh, Joe Cook and his colleagues got estimates of the value of time. And these are some of the first estimates of the uh, individual level value of time. So Unlike the uh, draft guidelines that Lisa has distributed, uh, which, which use population averages, as we move toward this kind of real data collection with households and asking people what they're really thinking, we're going to get a lot more heterogeneity um, in uh, outcomes. And these are the results. These are in the yellow dots are individual uh, estimates of the value of time. These are from a random uh, parameter logit models. And you can see they're all over the place. This is a ranking of the 300 plus respondents from low to high. And this is the value of the travel time, the time spent collecting water. This is the implicit value of time that they're assigning when they choose one water source over the other. So if you just look at the dots, you can see they're all over the place. If we used one dot to represent everybody in the sample, we would have really not understood local reality very well. Um, it, this, these are um, latent class models, and you can see that there's actually uh, one way of interpreting it. These, house, these are estimates from one uh, econometric approach. About a third of the respondents attached a very high value to time. I mean, so 
there's a big group that put a, a high value on on the time. In other words, they would pick a water source that was close to home, so they didn't have to to walk. Um, there's another group down here um, that essentially attached uh, no value to time. And then there's two group. Whoops. There's two groups here, um, here and and here, which attached a low value to time. The reason I, I point this out is that the, the same thing is probably true for VSLs um, and other things that we want to measure. And if we're going to take seriously this um, call to measure equity, we have to start looking in the detail at, at what people are really uh, thinking about these different non-health outcomes as well as uh, health outcomes. So I think that the movement that Dean described from cost-effectiveness analysis to cost-benefit analysis really takes us into the detail here about the heterogeneity in, in household preferences. And that's really important for all kinds of reasons. Um, one of the important reasons we really haven't talked about, but Lisa and Jim uh, did highlight in the guidelines, is that these benefit estimates are not just important um, for judging the costs and benefits. They're also important for judging uh, implementation issues and understanding how hard it's going to be to get things done. I mean, if you assume, in, in, for example, in this case, that everybody in this in these those are several different villages in rural Kenya, if they if they all valued time at the mean, you would wouldn't predict hardly anybody's behavior very well. So in terms of implementing the water project, you, um, you, you'd, you'd get it wrong, even if you got the aggregate costs and benefits more or less accurate. Um, the, the, the last point um, I want to make here it, um, uh, is, is coming back to uh, a point that uh, uh, Jack Konech made um, uh, this morning. Again, when we start looking in, in detail about what people in poor countries really think, how they really behave, which is the, which is the transition from cost-effectiveness analysis into this much more detailed cost-benefit analysis, um, we really do need to take account um, of differences in willingness to pay versus willingness to accept. And I, I put this quote up because it's a very, actually surprisingly old issue. Um, in economics. Adam Smith raised it in the theory of moral sentiments. He told us that we better look carefully at um, the difference between uh, the welfare improvements from a gain and a reduction in a loss. And so, again, if, we, if the individuals have in their head that um, they're uh, viewing this project as reducing um, uh, a loss, that they're going to come up with very different um, sort of behaviors and uh, and benefits too than if they're looking at it as as a, as a gain. So I think you know this this movement that Dean has described is really going to take us much more um, into the world of trying to understand household behavior at the micro level, not only to predict behavior but also to deal with equity issues. So that's my how about that. <laughs> Is there a corner? Okay. Um, I have a nondescript title, <laughs> but. There we go. Um, I actually am going to talk, even though this is supposed to be about non-health effects, I'm going to talk at the very beginning about uh, health effects as environmental economists have been looking at them. And I'm not going to duplicate in any sense what Maureen was talking about, who's been one of the leaders in actually trying to measure these things and assign values. But there's a lot of work by economists looking at this. Uh, what I do want to talk about first is there's been a lot of newer work that tries to identify causal effects. Um, and a lot of this is done in the US, uh, but not all of it. Uh, most of it tries to identify causal effect and then uses uh, typically VSL and in some instances cost of illness. 
Uh, so one of the things that's happening, and this is moving from these environmental pollutants that are known to cause health effects uh, to the work environment. So what do we now, now know? We now know that as ozone levels go up, uh, farm workers pick less fruit. Uh, there's a study in Ukiah, California, which has almost perfect air, except when bad air blows in from the San Francisco Bay, and they pick, uh, they pack fewer uh, Harry and David pear baskets <laughs> when the particulates are higher. And in Indian garment factories, it's now been shown that workers produce less cloth uh, when the particulates go up. Uh, Low-skilled workers in Indonesia tend, and Brazil tend to get laid off. Uh, when they're abnormally high temperatures. Uh, test scores of fourth and eighth graders uh, and salaries change. Uh, there are lots of estimates now uh, involving lead and crime. Uh, in fact, uh, Jennifer Reyes has estimates showing, suggesting that about 50% of the crime wave in the 90s is due to lead exposure. And all of this is sort of figured out by looking at the fact that they rolled back uh, lead differentially in the US. Now, uh, Nicholas Mueller and one of his co-authors have looked at this from a different perspective. And they actually looked at the rollout of drinking water plants in the US. And the, they tended to use either lead or iron, depending on whether there was a foundry making those, whichever one was closer and have found very large changes in the number of homicides uh, by cities. Yep. So let me turn now to an example uh, that I've done. Um, and in this one, we look at uh, arsenic in rural Bangladesh. This turned out to be probably the favorite project of NGOs and uh, UNESCO and whatever, and it reduced the biological contamination uh, of water. And, and women were walking long distances to travel uh, with water. And, and Dale uh, actually has taken that. And in addition to stated preferences, you can, you can observe people's behavior and you can estimate what are called travel costs or household production models to do that. And that turns out to be a, a big effect. Uh, Unknowingly, they exposed uh, 50 to 70 million people uh, to fairly large quantities of arsenic. Uh, the public health community, after uh, observing this, and WHO called it the largest mass poisoning in history, uh, concentrated on two things. How could you get people to stop using the contaminated water? Uh, and they went through and they painted the the contaminated wells after they tested them uh, red or green if they were safe. And they also looked at the long-term health impacts. Uh, arsenic has got really bad sort of long-term health effects. Uh, we, uh, we stepped back and said, if you're going to have all these long-term health effects, there should actually be a set of effects that occur, occur somewhat in the middle of this. And uh, if you ever read or saw the movie Arsenic and Old Lace, what happens? People slow down. They get lethargic. Uh, it also turns out that they get disoriented. They get headaches. Uh, they get sores on their hands and feet. Uh, and it turned out that nobody knew the arsenic was there. And we show in various ways that with the appropriate controls that this is looks actually just like a really nice randomized trial of exposing different of exposing people to arsenic and no because nobody knew it was there and the effects are long term uh, nobody took any actions to sort of do this so we matched the data from arsenic uh, with the Bangladesh equivalent to the current population survey and. What do we do? We show that there's an 8% reduction in labor force hours. Okay. I hope that sort of sinks in. This is larger than the reduction in labor force hours associated with the Great Recession in the US. And this is an effect that nobody 
actually saw was there because what? The public health people were concentrating on a very different sort of effect. And none of this, there's a little bit of this that shows up in cost of illness. Uh, but mostly these people are just working less. And it turns out that they actually make up some of the income. Uh, there are big effects within households. Uh, small households can't adopt very well. Uh, older women tend to stay home to take care of the six people. Prime age men uh, tend to work a little bit more, making up some of the hours. And people, small landholders, people have very small farms, none of these people are rich, uh, basically suffer uh, a lot. And so anyway, there are all these interactions uh, with age. And so these are health effects that are showing up not in the usual channels. And we could look at lots of other things uh, and start seeing these. And all of these rely on the notion that at some point, somebody has actually run what an economist would now call a quasi-experiment. You roll out a program differentially. Uh, one country does something. One county does something. Uh, and you can estimate lots of these effects by going back in time and figuring out what this whole chain of activities. I mean, we're, we're actually estimating effects uh, typically 10 to 20 years down the road here. Uh, from when this first sort of started happening. Okay, uh, now let me turn to what I usually do. Um, I usually work on contingent valuation, uh, which is a stated preference approach to trying to determine uh, the monetary value, but not always the monetary value. In some developing countries, uh, we see these in terms of uh, willingness to contribute time to projects. Uh, we sometimes see uh, studies with other means of exchange, like bushels of maize. Um, but anyway, there are a wide range of applications. Uh, a lot of these are in the environmental area. We started out with sort of outdoor recreation, air and water quality. Uh, most of this stuff has moved on to ecosystem services, which are more complicated. We look at endangered species, ecotourism. Uh, Dale has pioneered a huge amount of work in environmental infrastructure uh, in developing countries, and so there's, there's now a lot of that work. Uh, other major areas uh, where this is applied, uh, crime, I'm actually talking with folks about trying to measure dignity and stop and frisk sort of activities, um, and did a big study for the British Journal at the British Ministry of Justice on criminal sentences for sort of uh, lower level uh, major crimes, uh, cultural amenities, health programs, and transport. So there's studies in over 130 countries. Um, the largest increase is actually in developing countries. So at some level, there are lots of issues, which Dale can speak probably much better than I can of doing these in developing countries, but there are a huge number of advantages of doing them. They're a lot less costly. You have much higher response rates. Um, and anyway, there are lots of names for these techniques. And I have a paper with Jordan Louvier where we try to sort out what the differences in particular ways of implementing these are. Uh, let's think about some lessons learned. People understand uh, the underlying theory of these things way better than they did, say, 20 years ago, or probably even 10 years ago. Uh, there are lots of behavioral effects that sort of lay on top of the usual neoclassical economic theory, uh, which are pretty robust. Uh, one thing that's been found is that realistic descriptions of the good really make a difference. People at one time just thought you would give people some vague description and Anyway, everything would work fine, but it's now well known that you need to give people a pretty detailed description of what they're going to get and how you're going to provide it. You, in some sense, have to face them with a real choice. Uh, the incentive structure of different ways of answering, asking these questions is now well known. Um, it was at one point thought that if you ask effectively the same question in different ways, that you should get the same answer. 
Uh, Ted Graves and I have a paper which shows that that's actually fundamentally wrong. Uh, that what happens is all the different ways of asking these questions provide people with a different set of incentives and or a different set of information. And indeed, the sort of pattern of differences that you find between the questions is consistent with that theory. Uh, and that just, uh, that doesn't make things bad. It just makes uh, how you interpret the answer something that you have to pay attention to and in how you structure the questions. Uh, there's been a lot of work on improved statistical estimators that are robust to various things and a lot of work on experimental design because what are you effectively doing in these surveys is that you're running experiments in the context of the survey by offering people choices. Let me talk about four recent uh, projects. Uh, I was one of the principal investigators on uh, the damage assessment for the British petroleum oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is a paper that came out uh, about three weeks ago in Science. It's the usual, actually, two-page paper. There's 374 pages of supplemental material. <laughs> um, anyway, the, this is sort of a, this is sort of the current state of the art. If you have uh, lots of resources to do things exactly right and dot all the I's and cross all the T's. So we came up with an estimate of $17 billion and uh, the government agencies of which there are lots and lots of state agencies settled with BP effectively for $17 billion in restoration uh, with the US usual sort of DOJ not commenting on the settlement. Um, so I have another paper. This one is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, with uh, J.R. DeShazza, Trudy's co-author, and um, Jeff Vincent at uh, the University at Duke. And what we look at here is we're looking at an upper middle income country and what they're willing to pay to protect these are residents in the greater Kuala Lumpur area to protect a large tract of tropical rainforest, one of the last tracks uh, left in Asia, and it exists because it used to be full of communist gorillas, uh, a great way to protect your tropical rainforest. <laughs> uh, anyway, what we did here was that we separated logging from poaching, uh, which these are governed by two different uh, environmental treaties, one involving what's known as red on logging and poaching on the biodiversity. So what people do is that they see things like this, uh, and they're going to make choices uh, between these policies. Uh, so the Harvard Biology Department, um, this is a project funded by the World Bank and the Global Environmental Facility in conjunction with the Malaysian government, uh, sorted out what types of animals get uh, basically uh, get uh, you know, eliminated uh, by logging and a different set get eliminated by poaching. Uh, and so we've got different numbers of hectares and we've got different ways. And there's lots of text and explanation that does this. So uh, as you log the land, we also get floods. Uh, you create jobs and their cost. And So we did that. The other thing we did was that the World Bank was very interested in doing the sort of high quality sampling that would be typical of the best US survey. So we spent a lot of money in conjunction with working with the Malaysian uh, Department of Statistics uh, coming up with a really good household frame. And then we had lots of callbacks. Uh, and then we were looking at the issue of, you know, what's the advantage of putting more and more money into the sampling? So we look at the BP survey. This was an enormously expensive survey because it's got a really high response rate and a monstrous number of interviewers. So let me just quickly do uh, the last two. We looked at removing copper uh, from recreation boats. So you paint the sides of boats. Uh, 
with copper. So what does the copper do? The copper kills barnacles and algae. Uh, they've been using copper on boats for a long time. Uh, we thought we would have a usual sort of copper tax cap and trade, you know, increase the tax, phase out the paint. Turned out it was very different. It was a capital replacement problem. Uh, and there was a constraint on boatyard capacity. And, and this, is, this is something, and, and Dale could talk to this too, once you actually get into seeing the decision problem that the people who, in this case, in, own the boats, you really see lots of different aspects of what's going on. And so this whole notion of constructing a contingent valuation survey and doing focus groups and pilot studies and, and whatever tells you a lot about what's happening on the demand side. And it's really hard to think about implementing effective policies without understanding that. Uh, in this case, just like this curve Dale put up, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in the willingness to pay to convert from copper to non-toxic paints uh, like silicone and epoxy. And that willingness to pay distribution has big implications for how fast this program goes. And, what we showed was that there's a group of people who have a fairly sizable positive willingness to pay to convert and stop doing harm to the environment. But there's also a group of people who actually love the fact that copper kills <laughs> all the stuff on their boat. So this program both goes faster in the beginning than if you took the average, and it goes a lot slower in the end. But overall, anyway, EPA at least was scaling this up. Uh, nationally, and we had figured out how to save roughly a billion dollars um, through this method. Let me talk about the last one, which I did with J.R. DeShazzo uh, at UCLA and Tamara Sheldon, a graduate student of mine uh, at the University of South Carolina. So the state of California is heavily interested in electric vehicles. Uh, they're all electric. I mean, one minute. All electric uh, and plug-ins. They get different uses. They get different miles driven on them. And here, it turned out that the state's not at all interested in doing a benefit cost analysis. The state is strictly interested in how these people are going to choose vehicles as a function of the incentives that they offer for these two types of vehicles and their, their magnitudes. And so as a result of this study, they've actually put in income caps on, how, on who can get the subsidies, cutting out most of the new Tesla buyers. Um, and one of the things they had to do in deciding that was to look at whether it was the value of the vehicle or the income of the person which they could basically put in a policy change on. And their desire is to maximize the number of electric vehicles given a subsidy pool of money that they had. And so you can, by getting the individual willingness to pay for these different vehicle choices, uh, you can do that. So I want to take a slightly different tack from the two preceding talks and deal with one specific non-health outcome, um, financial risk protection, and work on how to value the provision of that. <clears throat> so first, in principle, financial risk protection could be measured through prices in insurance markets. Um, so we're assuming that's pretty much out of the question where insurance markets don't exist. And given the nature of insurance markets for health in high income countries, uh, perhaps very misleading. Uh, so we're looking for alternative ways of measuring the value of the provision of financial risk protection. And this gets a little bit back to some of the points that Dale was raising. If we look um, across this left to right, 
from inside the health system to outside. Um, <clears throat> we have the health expenditures and health outcomes, which seem to me to be basically the subject of cost effectiveness analysis. Um, there are policies that affect the uptake of the interventions. Those policies, and I'm particularly interested in the policy of universal public finance, but they're regulatory policies, lending policies, a, a range of policies, but thinking, think universal public finance, um, have outcomes, including risk protection, financial risk protection, but also distributional outcomes in terms of the uh, costs, who bears the costs of the intervention, and distributional outcomes uh, concerning uh, who benefits uh, from the intervention. And this, this is a line of, of analysis that we've ended up uh, calling uh, extended cost effectiveness analysis, the kind of within the health sector look beyond the health outcomes only. Um, <clears throat> and benefit cost analysis, in, in my thinking, then goes one step further to the right to include a much broader range of outcomes. So if we're interested in systematically trying to incorporate in the valuation of a health policy, the consequences of that policy for risk protection, how might, might we go ahead? And <clears throat> there's a paper 15, like 10 or 12 years ago by Mark McClellan and John Skinner, it was actually um, pretty widely circulated before it was published on the incidence of Medicare. And it, it turns to um, quite old economics on analysis of risk. But they, they looked at the incidence of M Medicare in terms of you know, who paid the taxes and what were the dollar flows to the benefits. Um, particularly important, of course, was how long did the beneficiaries live. Poor beneficiaries um, lived a lot less long. So better off people put more into Medicare but better off people lived a lot longer to receive benefits from Medicare. And it was about a wash. So they, re they concluded Medicare was not uh, progressive, was not regressive. They then asked the question, well, what about the welfare value? If we put some imputed dollar value of the insurance that was being provided to the people whose health care was being financed by Medicare, how did that change the story? How would that change the story? Well, it turns out the upper income people all already had insurance of some, not all, mostly already had insurance, so that the insurance value uh, was heavily concentrated in the lower income groups. And uh, so they, from that perspective, concluded that Medicare was a highly progressive public insurance policy. What does that have to do with economic evaluation and health? Well, what, what they were doing was, in a sense, a very macro evaluation of a huge, huge uh, public policy. And what um, a number of us end, end up trying to do is to take basically a similar conceptual structure and apply it to the kinds of things we'd been applying cost effectiveness analysis to. How, do you, how would you add uh, something like this to a cost effectiveness analysis? So we, the first piece of work that we did on this was uh, to look at the treatment of tuberculosis in India, to ask the question of um, how, if there were public finance of the expansion of treatment coverage, what would that consequences of that public finance be across five income quintiles? So this, this kind of analysis that is inherently distribution sensitive and distribution oriented. What would be the distribution of the health outcomes heavily oriented toward the poor because among other things, TB is a disease much more relatively frequent in the poor. Um, the income distributional consequences were a little bit less clear because what public finance would do is crowd out a reasonable amount of private finance, but only private finance in higher income groups or mostly higher higher income groups because they were the ones already paying for it. Um, and on the risk protection, the insurance value, um, it was um, because the cost of tuberculosis treatment were pretty easily manageable out of pocket by high income people, there was 
by high income, I mean top quintile or two. There was relatively little insurance value to them for public finance, but for low income people, there was substantial potential insurance value. Uh, so that that's, was kind of the, the nature of thinking. How to put some numbers on that? Well, basically, the Arrow Pratt theory of risk aversion from half a century ago provides um, the elementary economics, elementary mathematics of that. And what I'd like to do is just show you a way we ha have for basically displaying the results on this. Um, so if V is the insurance value, what uh, McClellan and Skinner labeled the money metric value of insurance, the S what is the real value in some sense of an insurance premium um, to do this. The C is the cost of the intervention. Y is annual household income. Um, and P is the probability that the intervention is needed. Now, um, household income and P interact. You can think of lifetime incidents of tuberculosis or lifetime incidents of the need for it. And then you need to be thinking somehow in lifetime income terms. So this analysis, and it doesn't make a lot of difference as long as you do it the same way both ways. Um, so we're here looking at annual incidents and annual income. Um, and the, the metrics we end up, the figures of merit that we think are of interest are the value of insurance relative to the cost of the intervention. And the cost of the intervention relative to income. And how do we use the, the Arrow Pratt framework? Well, we assume a utility function for money. There's a whole huge literature on this um, of two sorts. One, the constant relative risk aversion, utility functions in an uncertainty environment, and then there are a set of mathematically totally similar estimates of a utility function on the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. That is basically how people feel about up and down swings in income. And what the only thing I could really say about that literature from trying to look at it is that it seems to be a total complete mess in terms of, of uh, no pattern, no clustering, really little clustering. Um, but people do seem to be risk averse. So how do we solve that problem? To get an equation, we had to have a we used the same number as uh, McClellan and Skinner, and they had a long series of arguments about why they liked their number. But the, just as a caveat to this sort of substantive findings, they're assuming a highly risk-averse uh, utility function. And um, so this is a, a quiz. I'm going to put this next slide up for 10 seconds, and then there'll be questions at the end. <laughs> <laughs> There, that's the slide. <laughs> okay, that's the that's the basic equation. That's actually pretty straightforward. This is the the picture that we uh, come to for trying to interpret our results. So we have let me say we had two basic approaches. This this is a picture to try to give um, conceptual structure to our results. The picture that we have for actually conveying the results, and we were trying to be serious about tuberculosis treatment. In India. We're trying to get the cost right, the epidemiology right, and I must say my TB friends never seemed to appreciate how carefully we were trying to do that, but neither were they able to correct our numbers very much. So I, I, wasn't, I never came across with anything other than the feeling that we tried to have an analysis that made sense. And how did we present the results of the analysis? We present those results um, as a dashboard with the columns in this dashboard being the income quintiles, and the rows in the dashboard being health benefits, that is tuberculosis deaths averted by income quintile. Um, we're looking at a population of 100,000. Uh, the tuberculosis deaths averted, the redistribution of income, the crowding out of expenditures by higher income people, uh, the monetary value of insurance, as we calculated it, and the cost uh, to government. So we were not trying to collapse 
all those dimensions into a single fi figure of merit or single ratio, it could be done. We could generate a benefit cost ratio, and, I, and for some purposes, I think that, that would be a sensible thing to do. Anyway, our main results were in terms of just laying out that dashboard of consequences by income quintile. And the <clears throat> slide here, which I close on, um, is an attempt to structure, w provide a picture of where the insurance value is coming from. So it's not, I'm sorry, not readable. The x-axis is the intervention cost relative to income. And of course, it goes, as we've drawn it, from zero to one. But of course, inter intervention cost could be greater uh, than income. And we didn't actually deal with that quite properly. And the um, vertical axis is the value metric, the value of the insurance expressed as a fraction of the cost of the intervention. And the three graphs represent um, three levels of risk of annual incidence rates uh, for tuberculosis. And what the um, picture then attempts to show is how the value of the insurance for tuberculosis treatment, for public finance of tuberculosis treatment, how that insurance value increases uh, with the cost of the intervention and uh, with the likelihood that um, it will be needed. So that's uh, what we've tried to do. And, and the idea, basically, then, is to be thinking about if risk protection, financial risk protection, is the other main outcome of what health systems should be doing, changing the level and distribution of health outcomes on the population, and providing the population protection against financial risk, uh, then an analysis that incorporates those two, that kind of, which is clearly a subset of the full benefit cost analysis, uh, would have relevance from the perspective of health sector policies. Thank you. And we will hear now from Brad Wong. So just while we're getting my slides up, um, if you were to look at this list of the last seven speakers, you'll see that um, they all come from universities. They're, if you were to look up their names in a database, you would find hundreds, if perhaps not thousands, of articles written by them. Um, if you were to look up me in a database, you might find four papers from 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD, um, and none of them are on cost-benefit analysis. So. Um, I just sort of put that caveat out there because I'm very different. My background is very different compared to the last seven speakers. Um, so I want, to, I want to tell you all a little bit about the organization I work for, Copenhagen Consensus Center. Um, Dale's mentioned a little bit, and um, Anil before has mentioned uh, what we do in passing this morning. Um, and also I'll tell you about my role within the center because I think it provides an interesting perspective on this problem that um, Lisa and Jim and others have been, you know, you know, been commissioned to to uh, to work on is how do you standardize methodology across all of these different approaches and all of these different disciplines? Because essentially, that's part of my job. So, what what does the Copenhagen Consensus Center do? Um, so, this is the logical extension of when you're of where you go when you try to do this multi-sectoral comparison between um, areas of, of, um, based on cost-benefit analysis. This is from our recent project in Haiti that Dale was a part of. Um, we've also worked in the part, oh, Rachel was also um, a co-author on, on, on one of the papers. And we've worked with Dean and, and, and Anna before. Uh, this is the somewhat of the logical extension to, um, to that exercise. That for different areas, so here, I'm only showing a subset of our results. So we've got nutrition, electricity and energy, equality and education. You're able to put 
the benefit, well, this is the, the metric we use, benefit cost ratio, the benefit for every dollar spent. Um, I won't go into the numbers and the analysis behind this because I think that will open up a whole sort of, you know, a whole, we'll go in a whole different direction that we don't really want to go into t today. But my role in the center is to be the gateway kind of for all of the analysis to come through. I set up the research framework, I work with the authors, I try and get as much consistency as possible between all of the different, um, between all of the different areas. And let me tell you that one, that's a really, I feel very humbled and it's a great honor to work with lots of different, very intelligent people who are very accomplished within their fields. And at the same time, the hardest part of my job is to actually get people to be consistent because within different areas of um, academia and within different areas that of, of academic inquiry, sometimes like certain ways of doing things have become entrenched and they've become entrenched for maybe 50 years, 30, 40, 50 years. And it becomes, um, it becomes somewhat of a challenge to try and push people and push academics who have been used to working within one way of doing things to expand their way of thinking. And um, Richard made the point earlier in the day, which I thought was, which I resonated with quite a lot, which is that we have to, when we're trying to do these cross-sectoral analyses, we have to try and push ourselves and the researcher has to push themselves to identify as much of the benefits as possible. Because if you stop at a certain point, and you're stopping at a certain point and another researcher or another set of researchers stop at a different point, then there's an inherent challenge in comparing the two. Now, having said that, in my experience of working at the center for the last three years, um, those uh, differences are not overall critical. I think that as a general rule, there's enough consistency that we're getting directionally in order of magnitude, the cost benefit ratio is, or the benefit cost ratio is um, approximately right and better than if we hadn't done this exercise at all. But at the same time, there's definitely areas of improvement and I want to talk to you about those areas of potential improvement um, with respect to uh, nutrition and education interventions. Um, so what I, just by the way, I want to uh, give a sense of, before I continue, that these are only four different areas and so the, the full project, you can see in that box there on the bottom right, had um, 85 different interventions. We had uh, 63 economists, uh, 40 different papers, and across 15 dis different disciplines. So, um, you know, governance was uh, governance was one. Environment, climate change, um, uh, you know, gender equality. There was uh, quite a lot of different and um, diverse uh, areas of research. So, focusing on nutrition and education. My general um, experience with the researchers that I've worked with in this field is that the focus tends to be on lifetime productivity benefits. The focus tends to be on um, the focus tends to be on after you've gotten the intervention, whether that's education or nutrition, what happens to you over the long run? How more productive are you in society? Um, and, the, and that's usually measured by wages. So I think in education, that makes a lot of sense. That sort of stems from the human capital theory and, and it, you know, that's a logical conclusion of trying to identify the benefits of education. That sooner or later, you'll end up in the workforce and if you have better education, you will be more productive and you'll earn more. Education economists, unsurprisingly, tend to stop there. That's where, that's as far as they go. And that's despite the fact that as I think Dean's um, mentioned earlier that there's lots of different externalities and there's lots of benefits from from uh, from education, not just with, within health, but within um, social cohesion, crime, environment, fertility, and intergenerational effects. Nutrition, I find to be somewhat of an interesting case because the, the cost benefit. Well, nutrition in and of itself is the, the field of study. I think has been around for a very long time. But cost-benefit analysis in nutrition is, I think, relatively short history. And nutrition has both immediate health and cognitive benefits, and they also have long-term health 
and productivity benefits. And theoretically, you could look at both. And I mean, yes, you have to worry a little bit about double counting and making sure that you're um, consistent in you know uh, making you know that the uh, that the effects of sorry one second the you have to be consistent in the fact that the um, that the immediate cognitive benefits will will lead to the long term productivity benefits. But what the nutrition um, literature has tended to do, or at least the cost benefit um, researchers have done, they tend to focus on the long term productivity productivity benefits and and not the short term ones. And again, like the education literature, the health benefits tend not to be, not tend not to be considered. So when we look at education, what's what, what what's the classic approach here? The classic approach is to look at what are called these age earning, um, age income profiles, and compare them, compare the costs and the benefits, uh, compare the costs and the wages between different and adjacent um, levels of education. So you have this one profile here, which is the secondary school leavers. They, at 18, will, will, will graduate, and then they'll earn some money. The uh, university graduates will start a bit later because they've had to be in school for a bit longer, and then they'll earn a little bit more of a wage. And the, uh, the benefits are obviously the increase in wages, and the costs are just the difference in um, the time spent being in university Less the um, plus the uh, direct costs of education. These age income profiles are typically based on wages that are observed in um, household surveys and labour market surveys. They're done cross sectionally, so there's no long term or trend analysis in what um, uh, in these estimates. That leads to a few sort of conceptual problems because what you're doing is that if you're doing the cost-benefit analysis now, you're assuming that what's occurred in the past is now a representative of, uh, of the current intervention that will lead to benefits in the future. They're typically only formal sector wages um, and they exclude benefits in in-kind goods like food and shelter. Um, they're sometimes adjusted for uh, future real growth in wages, but sometimes not and they're rarely adjusted for unemployment and mortality. And I think that, that last one is potentially um, gives an insight into this, this point that I was making at the beginning, that within certain fields of inquiry, the whole field, um, you know, there's, some, there's some customs and there's some ways of doing things that get entrenched, and one of these is not adjusting for unemployment and mortality. And the reason is, when you're comparing different levels of education, if the unemployment level is relatively consistent or the differences, um, the unemployment level is relatively consistent between different levels of education attainment, then you don't need to adjust for it because the relative rankings will be roughly the same. But when you start comparing education to something like health or governance or infrastructure, then you need to be cognizant of the implicit assumptions in the way that you're doing things because then if you, you, know, if you keep them, you may be biasing your interventions up or down. So I think that the two big areas in which you can improve education cost-benefit analysis is one is taking into account the wider social effects. They can be significant and they're often excluded. So this is some work that um, has been done by the uh, Education Commission, um, with which Dean was part of. And you can see that for different, um, for different income levels, if you just look at the earning benefits of education, then you get benefit cost ratios of five, three, and one um, as you go up the, uh, the income, uh, income levels. If you include the health benefits of the interventions, then the benefit cost ratios are very, um, can be very significantly different. So. In low-income countries, the benefit-cost ratio is, is twice as large with health benefits and earning benefits as compared to just if you only had earnings benefits. And then you can see here the effect is slightly you know, less pronounced for lower middle-income countries. And again, it's twice as large for upper middle-income countries. 
I think the second area in which education um, cost-benefit analysis could potentially be improved, or at least there can be some greater thinking around, is that a lot of the macroeconomic evidence suggests that education or earnings is, uh, sorry, not earnings, but um, economic growth is linked to education quality and not education quantity. But the previous classic way of doing education CBA is to look at years in which you've been at school. And so what really potentially is happening here is that the years in which you're in school is proxying for the quality of education very roughly. Um, and, it's, and it's somewhat, um, th that's how the education quality element comes through with the, uh, into the analysis. But wouldn't it be better if we just found a way to link education quality to earnings rather than going through this somewhat of a proxy through education quantity or the number of years of schooling? So that's one, one area um, in which you could have a greater improvement. And this graph here is um, showing test scores down the bottom and conditional growth. This is a paper by Hanasek and uh, Wurstman in 2007. Um, and it shows that there's a pretty good association between education quality and, and growth. There's another graph in that paper, which I won't show, that indicates that correlation is not as strong if you're just looking at years of schooling. So nutrition is a big area in which, um, I'll just finish up very quickly. How, how much time do I have? So nutrition is a big area in which Copenhagen consensus has advocated because the benefit cost ratios tend to be very high and they tend to have been prioritized by um, the panels in which we present our work to. And my understanding, or the, at least the um, at least the cost-benefit analysis that we've been exposed to, is that the focus has tended to be on the long-term productivity benefits, particularly with respect to stunting. So the evidence around stunting is that if you don't get enough um, micronutrients and you don't get enough macronutrients when you're when you're young, you um, your cognitive ability is reduced, you are less productive in the workforce later. There's also a higher risk of um, mortality. Um, when you're a child, and also higher risk of uh, adult diseases such as um, diabetes, and and the um, there's two potential ways that you could value the benefits. One is to look at the health side, which is around the lower risk of child and um, child and mortality and morbidity, and also the uh, long-term effects on adult mortality and morbidity. You could also look at the non-health benefits. In the long run, not being stunted is associated with higher education attainment. It's associated with increased wages in adulthood, and it's also associated with increased household consumption. Now, you can't value all of these benefits because there's probably some element of double counting, but there's no reason, I think, that you can't value some of the health benefits, particularly the child mortality and morbidity benefits, and the adult productivity benefits, but that doesn't happen. So health benefits tend to be absent in uh, cost-benefit analysis of nutrition. Um, and I think one of the sort of quick wins is to just suggest to people that are in this field that they can, that they can do it. And it's not inconsistent with um, valuing adult productivity benefits. Um, and in the, uh, in the bottom sort of category of benefits and the non-health benefits, I think the primary research, research gap here is one of evidence and um, not one of not one of methods necessarily. Uh, we really only have one good quality study of the long term effects of not being stunted, and that's John Hodnot's paper from two thousand and thirteen. Um, and that's you know sort of just a very well, it's a very good study. Um, it's it's difficult to hang your hat on just one study in one context from forty years ago. Um, yeah, so I just that's that's basically. Oh, so I was going to talk about ag agricultural benefits, but I think I'll stop there because I'm sure I ran out of time.
Okay, so we'll start with some questions uh, from the audience. Um, please. Thank you. A quick question for, for Dean about uh, the work that um, you've been doing on, on, on extended cost effectiveness analysis and, uh, and also with, uh, with Oli um, uh, Cookson's work on this distributional cost effectiveness analysis. Just, just to, to see what you think about um, how this type of consideration could be accommodated uh, across different types of analysis so it's not you know, CBA specific or whether it is perhaps. And, and, and a second um, point question for Brad, if I may. Um, well, a, a, a couple of things, and it's got to do again with the, the, the discussion earlier on, on, on where do you stop? What is the perspective of the analysis and the time frame? Um, and and uh, we were discussing with Rico earlier this idea of uh, double counting. And I guess um, some of the discussions we've been having uh, when I was at NICE, at least we were talking about, uh, say, somebody gets a drug A, their life is saved or extend it, and then uh, say they get cancer. And there's lots of costs associated with treating cancer. So should you consider uh, taking into account those costs? And the flip side of that, of course, you know, somebody um, gets a drug and gets, uh, you know, survives, lives longer. Um, and there's also, you know, becomes more productive even, though that's perhaps unlikely if you have cancer anyhow. Um, and there's a road traffic type of sort of intervention and, and, and their lives get saved or they don't have a terrible accidents so they're very productive and, and they go to school and they become, you know, they're really smart and they get a good job, so they're very productive. How many times do you count that productivity? Because um, it might get confusing. Thanks. Dean, I think you're... you're <coughs> well, well, thanks. Uh, yeah. Hello? Yeah. Um, my sense, clip, so if this addresses uh, your question, is that in spirit and practice, extended cost effectiveness analysis is closer to cost effectiveness analysis than it is to BCA. We're not trying to aggregate benefits in the way that BCA does, and we're focused fairly narrowly on what happens within the health system, which, which is not all that narrow, but it's a good deal narrower than BCA can be. So, Calypso, if I understand your question, your question was around when do you stop counting or when do you stop? Yeah, it's it's a good question because it's something we've been dealing with the Copenhagen consensus for a while. There's um, yeah, there, there's you can get very different answers depending on where you stop sometimes, and I and the the sort of classic example that we're grappling with is one around family planning. So. If you and remember, Copenhagen consensus focuses mainly on cost, uh, benefit cost ratio, right? So the so the benefits for every dollar spent. So with family planning, it's very inexpensive, and the benefits can be quite significant relative to the to the cost um, the cost uh, you know of, of doing the family planning program. Um, you save some maternal lives, you save some child lives, and they can be very um, highly valued and the cost of delivering family planning is extremely small. However, when you deliver family planning, what the next step of that is usually some form of increase in education attainment, particularly for women. And education um, attainment is high cost and high benefits. And the net benefits are large, um, but the benefit cost ratio tends to be around so let's say five, or like in that in that slide that I presented, it's about five. Um, so the when when, when we're, from our perspective, when we're focusing on the benefit cost ratio, what ends up happening if you take the next step, you get something that if you just looked at family planning, it would have a benefit cost ratio of perhaps forty or fifty, and then you take then you go to the next step, and then you you put in the benefits and the costs in the denominator, and there overweight the analysis and so what you end up with is a weighted average of the family planning and the education and the benefit cost ratio drops all of a sudden down to about four and a half. But most people would say that the fact that you have more um, education as a benefit, if the education wasn't there, if that didn't induce women to go to school, 
your benefit cost ratio would be 40. But if, because it induces women to go to school, your benefit cost ratio drops down to about four and a half. Now, the net benefits are much bigger. So that's definitely, um, uh, you know, that's definitely something to be recognized. Um, but that issue of where do you stop is, is, a, is a challenging one because you could go down to the next level and then say that primary education leads to secondary education, which um, leads to, I don't know, some other, you know, some other benefits. Um, and that's hopefully something that will be addressed by this research. If um, I want to just take a liberty in following up on this a little bit, two things. One is, my question is defend or refute. My answer to the um, which consequences do you include is all the ones, and then the ones that are quantitatively insignificant obviously can be dropped. But if some intervention changes the world, we're comparing the state of the world with the intervention, with the state of the world without it. And so you don't arbitrarily leave out things that are different. You only leave out things that are different if they don't affect the answer. And then just to pick up on what you're addressing, Bradley, the um, ratios can be highly misleading, as you just illustrated. Net benefits does give us the right answer. A small benefit cost ratio on a giant program could be much more valuable than a high benefit cost ratio on a small program. Lynn, I think you're next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Lynn Carley from uh, the Rand Corporation. So most of my experience is, imply, is in applying benefit cost analysis in the U.S. context, programs serving children, youth, and families. And ultimately, what we're able to value is driven by what's measured in the evaluation evidence, either retrospective or prospective, and um, how long we follow participants. So are we only observing short-term impacts or do we have the long-term follow-up? Um, and when we don't have the long-term follow-up, where can we make causal linkages, either between an early measure and that same measure in the future, or linkages from one outcome to some other future outcome? Um, so I'm interested in, I guess, Brad, really for you, whether or not what you were pointing out, where there are some of these gaps and what is and isn't valued, how much of that is driven by the fact that many of these outcomes just aren't measured in evaluation, so we don't have the evidence to know how big the impacts are, or that we don't have those kind of causal linkages. We may have correlational evidence, but we know that's not as strong or maybe as valid you know, as we would um, you know, we wouldn't feel as comfortable as using evidence that came from causal linkages. And I, I ask because I think one of the gaps here is, or potential avenues for making progress, is identifying a set of outcomes um, that we all should be measuring. So we can't measure the world, but we could decide if we're doing nutrition interventions, you know, in, in lower middle income countries, we should be measuring these set of outcomes consistently as core outcomes. Um, and likewise, we may need to improve the underlying literature about causal linkages. So where we have other data sets that let us look at those linkages that we're producing those estimates to use for this purpose. Okay, thank you. I, I believe you have a question. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot your yeah. name. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to follow up on this uh, issue of what we should be including. So what non-health outcomes should we include? Because it seems to me that each one that we include will obviously favor some patients and re it will relatively favor some patients and relatively not favor other patients. So, um, and which patients will benefit de depends on which outcome we're including. So whoever gets to choose which outcomes to include has quite a lot of power. Um, and related to that, I have another question. because It seems like there's a consensus here that, you know, we should try and include everything. Uh, I've not heard anyone say that we shouldn't try and include everything, so I'm going to say that. So, um, are there any principles that we should be following which might result in us excluding some non-health outcomes? And, and just for the sake of argument, so let's say that I went to, let's say I had an accident, I went to the emergency room, and when I arrive, the same moment I arrive, there's someone else who is exactly the same as me, same age, same illness, at the emergency room, except they're unemployed and I'm not. And we include productivity costs, well, they're going to prioritize me. And certainly back in Canada, where I live and, and in the UK, where I'm from originally, most people would be really uncomfortable with the thought that I would be prioritized solely because my income is higher 
than someone else. Right? But that is the implication of including productivity costs in our analysis that we would favor on the basis of income. And my understanding is, and those who've worked at NICE can correct me, my understanding is that a few years ago when NICE was asked to consider value-based pricing by the government, they, they responded to the government and said, no, we, we will not include productivity costs because of the equity issues that might arise. Now, of course, what I just said to you there was a, an extreme case. You, you're not going to do an analysis of treating me versus treating someone else. You don't do analysis at that level. But it can have implications. If you include productivity costs, then you will overall bias against the retired uh, children with chronic illnesses that will never be productive, right? Women, yeah, if women are, are paid less and that's how you're measuring productivity, right? There's all of these biases that'll creep in. So you could take a principled position and say, we will not consider productivity. And in fact, you could even say that including productivity would violate the Canada Health Act, the NHS Constitution, these laws that would say you should not make allocations of resources based upon income. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So it, <laughs> it, it brought, to, uh, <laughs> brought them together. So, so anyway, so I, I'll finish my question. Basically, there are some principles which might result in us excluding some of these non-health outcomes. And, and I've just heard a consensus that we should include everything. Maybe we shouldn't. And I just want the panel's opinion. Maybe to... Okay. Let, let me address that speaking as the um, speaking as the PI on the project because I think that this is fundamental to what we're trying to do here and I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, we are trying to write, so there's this concept of fit for purpose, which actually I think it, it's a Peter Newman phrase, I think, but uh, um, the idea is that whenever you're doing analysis, you have to take into account the context, the decision maker, the nature of the problem. Um, and decision making for NICE is going to be different than decision making for the US Environmental Protection Agency, which is going to be different than working on a nutrition program in a low and middle income country. So um, what we are trying to do here is come up with some general principles, understanding that you might look at our principles and you might look at our recommendations and you might say that because I'm doing work for NICE, um, I'm going to do something different in my primary analysis, but because I know that all kinds of people want to be able to compare my results to the results of analyses done in other places, and you know, some, you know, the 26th appendix in my 300 and how many pages do you have in your science article? Um, I'm going to put a sensitivity analysis in there um, that uses the reference case, the files reference case guidelines. So if somebody wants to compare what we are doing here in the UK to something that's being done in another country, they have that comparator. So first of all, that's the framing for our project. Um, the second thing is that um, I have a, those of you who've sat in uh, courses I've taught get tired of seeing the same uh, graphics over and over again, so I didn't put them all here, but um, I have one that, uh, um, that tries to address this issue of, of counting everything, because we don't actually mean that you go through the whole process for everything. What we do mean is that if you, to do a good job on benefit cost analysis, the very first thing you need to do is sit down, define the problem clearly, and write down everything you can think of that might be an outcome. Talk to people who are experts in that area and make sure that you have a pretty comprehensive list. Um, the next step is to do some sort of um, uh, just simple analysis to see what might be important. And I have to tell you that you know I've done a lot of these, and the ones that have turned out the best are the ones where we've spent a lot of time um, doing some uh, analysis up front using you know, very, uh, you know, really wide parameter values um, to see what's important because that's where you start understanding that your intuition is wrong about some things. And then you decide, okay, of the you know, 26 things I wrote down, what am I going to include in the quantitative measures that go into my analysis? And there's really two things that we like to think about. And one is, What's important for analytic results? What's going to either drive the decision about whether or not a particular option has net benefit, or is going to drive the decision about the relative ranking of the different things you're looking at? Um, but there's a second thing, which is um, what are decision makers going to ask me about? Um, where's Neil? So, so Neil works in the air office at EPA, and I, it wasn't Neil, it's was one of his uh, um, coworkers. Um, I want to ask him, why do you guys have asthma in all of your analyses? Because asthma is not driving the results. It's, I don't remember what fraction it is, but it's tiny. Um, and what he told me is that 
people don't understand the concept of premature mortality. So even though we have these very big numbers of the, the VSL multiplied by the change in risk, um, what they asked me about or asked the EPA administrator about when he goes to meetings is what's it going to do about asthma? Because they understand asthma. It's in their communities and people have it. Um, so, so then what I end up with is an analysis that has in it quantified measures of the things that are most important using those types of criteria and has some discussion of all the things that I left out of the analysis um, and says this means my numbers are biased downwards, these means my bi numbers might be biased us. These are some things that I think are important and I don't know which way they're going to swing the analysis. So that's what we mean by value everything. It's, it's, it's a more, more, uh, more phased approach, I guess. Could I take a crack at that, Lisa? Are you well, OK. Yes. Uh, let, let me comment on three three things that have been raised. First off, this value everything is, you know, this is a complete sort of red herring. Um, what you should do is, as Lisa's saying, lay out what you think the, the possible impacts are. Oftentimes, you've got a good idea of what the value of those effects are if they exist. And so there's both the physical side that you've got to quantify what the health effects are, and then there's the valuation side. And, and most of the issue here is actually going to occur more on quantifying the physical effects. And in response to the, the question that was raised earlier, one of the things that, that there's been a lot of progress on is finding these quasi-natural experiments where you can get causality estimated fairly well and compare that to the correlational analysis and see how badly off the correlations are. So the problem with the quasi-experimental estimates is that they, they aren't that general. You have to look for these sort of quirky examples where people rolled out experiments, rolled out programs at different times, or one health department did something or whatever. But you can get some idea then of, of how far off the correlations are. And on the last thing, some notion that we have all these sort of free degrees of uh, <laughs> degrees of freedom in doing analysis. So I, I do lots of the government's big natural resource damage assessments. The Department of Justice tells me who I have to count. They give me the set of injuries. They tell me what measures I can use. OMB dictates the discount rate. I mean, all of these, th these are not free parameters that are in general out there. So if the Canadian health system and the UK health system says that I can't take a particular factor into account, then you just don't take it into account because that's an institutional decision that sort of governs the rules of the game. And I don't know that any of us, you know, have any, you know, th those are political decisions that are made, and that's fine because that's how the government's decided to. It's going to evaluate programs. Um. Could I? Yeah. Um, so let me try your question a, a, a little bit different way. Um, it seemed like the consensus this morning was that um, we could effectively use uh, cost effective analysis uh, in intra sectoral questions, and health was the example. So it would work in health. But once we moved into other sectors and w had to worry about non-health outcomes, it wasn't going to work. I, I think the takeaway message from the panel is that that's wrong. Um, and non-health outcomes and health outcomes occur <laughs> together. It's not so obvious what a health uh, intervention is. So um, taking your example of uh, the possibility of productivity including productivity, hurting poor people. I can take an, the exact opposite example and say not including non-health outcomes in the water and sanitation sector, ignoring time savings, hurts women and children and the poor, right? So I, I, I think that the issue of incorporating equity is, is different, and I would argue that you should do the cost-benefit analysis and you should do the equity analysis, and then people can look at them both. Um, but I, I don't think it's right that by including non-health outcomes, we're always disadvantaging uh, the poor and women and other groups. I think it, um, that's a very um, specific instance of a particular project. And you have to look to see who's, who's disadvantaged. 
Anil, have, you've been uh, very, yeah. yes. Uh, I have a yeah. slightly different question to pose and, and maybe Dale can take a crack at it. Uh, because some of your work, especially when you have surveyed the literature on, on uh, uh, water, willingness to pay for water improvements, uh, you generally found that people are not very willing to pay for, uh, for sort of uh, uh, large publicly provided water improvement systems. Uh, there's some work that I myself did 25 years ago uh, looking at the parents of ostensibly undernourished children in, in some of the poorest regions in India. And, and when these people received an exogenous sort of increase in incomes, uh, they did not choose to direct much of that income to their to nutrition to child nutrition and and more recently work by development economists like Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duplo has found the same that people in India uh, when they have when they uh, when they sort of are given uh, additional income in experiments they choose to go out and buy cell phones with that uh, rather than spend it on their children's nutrition so this is a broader issue where somehow the subjects involved don't value uh, some of these benefits the same way that we external observers value these benefits, uh, the non-health benefits. And, and I wonder uh, how one sort of squares these two facts. Much of BCA is sort of uh, rooted in, in benefits that we perceive flow from, uh, from certain interventions uh, and uh, uh, if if the subjects themselves, especially the poor, don't see the benefits in the same way, uh, what are we really sort of getting at? And and there's this inconsistency that I sometimes grapple with. Uh, thank you, Neil. It's a it's a good question. I mean, the the specific uh, example you gave of cell phones versus water is a good one uh, because most of us would probably think that. Um, uh, people in developing countries would be better off with uh, water. I mean, then most of us would think it'd be better off with improved water than cell phones. I'm not sure that's right, honestly. Um, uh, I mean, cell phones do a whole lot of uh, uh, good for a uh, uh, people in all kinds of ways, right? So I, you know, it, it gets back to this question that Jim uh, asked, you know, pointed out this morning about consumer sovereignty. And I'm not saying that people always get these choices right. But to put ourselves in a situation of uh, poor people trying to choose between water and cell phones is actually rather complicated. I, the other point I would make is that in, at the Water and uh, Finance Minister's meeting at the World Bank uh, last month, um, uh, Jim Kim, the, the, the president, was um, saying, yeah, and, and, and water has a cost-benefit ratio of five, uh, uh, five, right? So, and so it, it, the, the implication was that it's a cost-benefit ratio of five. It, we don't really need to analyze it anymore, right? It, it, it's, it's a great investment. Just forget about the economic analysis. And I think there's just much more heterogeneity. I mean, the way you characterize my work is it, not inaccurate, but I, in some places I found people really value water a lot more than cell phones or almost anything else. In other places, they, they didn't. So I think then you, you, it takes us back into really trying to figure out, you know, uh, in, in this heterogeneity and, and what's right. And so I, I would be cautious, though, about um, just assuming that people are stupid, that poor people are stupid. That kind of, that's kind of a, a, a way of, a, you know, a story that, you know, we tell, they don't really understand long-term effects. And, of course, that, some of that's true. I mean, I'm, you know, I've... I've uh, run surveys with, uh, you know, whoever been responsible over the years for tens of thousands of people. And there's, there's one story that John Briscoe and I, you know, ran across in our early days of work where we, we ran across an Ill illiterate farmer in, in Pakistan. And we were asking all these, you know, questions and I've been, and he, 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 he stopped us and said, you know, I'm, I'm illiterate. Um, these are really hard questions for me. I have to think really hard about this. <laughs> Because I'm not as educated as you, right? I mean, I, I've always stuck struck with me. I mean, the idea that people are, you know, are poor and stupid, you know, it's kind of the opposite in some ways. They they actually have to make some very difficult choices and think about this is very hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
True. True. But but this gets us into this issue about how, really trying to understand behavior. So we say, well, they don't, you know, they really should value water systems. And then so they have high discount rates and they shouldn't be buying cell phones. So we're going to give them water systems and they don't use them. I mean, because they don't value them. I mean, right. So I think we have to be really careful about about this. And that's what we're trying to do in this cost benefit analysis is 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 go from the expert assessment of people's preferences down and really try to figure out you know what's in their heads and and you know th these are all tough questions you're asking but I don't really think it's a, uh, it's going to work for us to sit here in Seattle and try to figure out what people should be doing and try to figure out what their values should be and do the cost benefit analysis on some expert assessment I think we really do need to go into the field and try to sort some of these things out. So. Are we, do we have time for one more question? Or Okay, one last question. Okay, yes. question about financial risk protection, Dean. Uh, this task force I mentioned that's really focused on the U.S. has really embraced the idea that you guys have developed. It's a very important addition to thinking about value. So at the same time, we are thinking mostly about the U.S. We're thinking about new medicines, new devices, new diagnostics. And when we think about health, we think we do think like, you know, health gain, defined as life extension and quality of life improvement, is the core of most value. But this is an add-on, this financial risk protection. So my question is, how much on an absolute basis, percentage basis, does financial risk protection add above the quality gain in something in terms? And is it, does it affect things relatively across technologies? Okay. And then you may have seen the work recently by Darius Lakdawalla on the, the, another component of insurance value, which is physical risk protection, that I'm better off if something's available. It's not just financially protected. I'm protected now that if someone's invented a cure to Alzheimer's, I have a shot at it. It's valuable to me. So we're talking about adding those kinds of things. I just would be interested in your reaction, uh, have any reaction to that at all. So, Well, I think um, very good questions. Um, in terms of the V over C, the, va the value of insurance over the cost and income, the kinds of numbers that I was typically getting would be um, – 10 or 15 or 20 percent. So um, that's not big. It's not trivial. It's not to be ignored. The, um, I think in a higher income environment, however, uh, those numbers could look very, very different. And there is a, a second line of argument, however, around why one should be paying attention to actually measuring the value of financial risk protection and looking at the most efficient ways you can buy it. And, and not to be too simplistic about it, but there's a community of economists, some of them at the World Bank, who seem to think that the main purpose of public finance and health is financial risk protection, that risk protection is provided by paying for expensive things. Their analyses have no basis of understanding in what types of conditions lead to bad that health, bad health conditions can lead to bad financial outcomes, yes. But which ones? They have no idea. They propose no um, alternative ways of purchasing risk protection. And so the agenda here is if you're going to add risk protection, don't just argue throw your money at expensive interventions, which is uh, a lot of what we're trying to get away from, is to, to counter that line of health systems thinking, of health economics thinking. Um, and then if you're going to be thinking about buying risk protection, think about efficient ways to do it. Maybe it's cheaper to keep people out of the hospital in the first place than pay for the hospital bill when they're there. But that's not where the risk protection discussion is in um, certain categories of economics. Well, I think we should thank the panelists, and uh, we will conclude the session. So we do need to try and finish up by five, but uh, I wanted to circle back to um, sort of where we started and talk a little bit about w where we're going um, and get some advice from this group. Um, uh, 
I'm not sure whether uh, we won any prizes for artistic talent here, but you'll see that the scoping meeting is not quite at the bottom of the box that says scoping report. Um, the reason for that is that, that we're not done with the scoping phase yet. Um, we are still collecting um, comments online on the report. We hope you'll also submit comments on this workshop. Um, and we have over a thousand people on our email list, um, so I would not think that just because you and I had a conversation in the hallway um, that I'm going to remember and your comments are going to get counted. Please go to the website and, and, and type them up. Um, there's just too many people involved for this project um, for me to make sure that we hear everybody unless we um, have a way of collecting it. Um, but the other thing about this, um, about this graphic is to remind you where we're going. Um, the next thing we need to do are these methods, papers, and case studies. Um, I'm wondering if um, any of you could give us some advice on um, what you think we should do next. Um, are there particular areas that maybe are on our list or aren't on our list that should or shouldn't be? Um, are there particular types of case studies or particular types of non-health outcomes that you think should be high priorities for us? Um, any other thoughts about what you think should go into this next phase would be uh, really welcome and very useful. Too tired. Want to go home? Oh, do, we've got a hand over here. No? Uh, I'm not sure what the mic. The way that a risk protection program is uh, is designed uh, would be informed by that. Um, another, uh, say, on the non-health benefits, what what populations benefit most on non-health benefits? So we may want to think, may give us insights about how to target a program. Um, uh, another insight I got from this the meeting is the the, uh, the heterogeneity, so that a we can we. We learn we can look at a program as a whole, but we can also look at different uh, subgroups. And that may be very useful about prioritizing uh, subgroups. So within each, well, within each subgroup, we can look at the costs and the benefits and essentially prioritize subgroups that might receive a program in the same way that we use cost effectiveness or cost benefit to set priorities among uh, interventions. Uh, uh, so one side group, so the group that benefits a lot relative to its cost uh, would deserve a, uh, a high priority. Um, another piece on uh, sort of extension of benefits uh, that's come up a lot in the uh, work I do in dengue uh, is whose uh, who's benefits to count. So the uh, narrowly you take the patient, him or herself, but uh, just like the, the, the famous slogan, it takes a village to raise a child. If somebody gets ill, typically the whole household uh, is impacted uh, by that. So it may create strains in the household and affect their, their, uh, their quality of life. And it certainly puts demands on the time of the household. So if a child is sick, uh, the a parent or several parents may take care of them. In developing countries, if somebody is hospitalized, a relative is the caretaker and takes that time off to go to the, uh, the hospital and be with them that time. So, that, so that's sort of another part of the methods that I think is important in that, and particularly in that environment, that I haven't heard that much about in the meeting that would encourage you uh, to look at. That's very helpful. Thanks. Other thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is a separate paper or part of all of these papers, but I, I do think we heard a bit, well, I raised it, and I think um, Rachel and um, the colleague from RAND, on, I think, and then also as well, um, Brad, um, is something on uh, valuing not just within a sector, but the cross-sectoral thing. And that's different than um, non-health outcomes. But 
again, I think there's more and more programming that is happening across sectors to improve health and development. And um, I think people are struggling, or certainly I am, on how do you effectively capture measures, both um, um, valuing um, all the health and non-health outcomes, as well as the costs. So that's a, a request. That's a great thing. Hi, I'm Sarah Qureshi Metzger from the Gates Foundation. Um, just to kind of build on your question, um, I think some of those uh, intersector or in, in intersector, yes, um, analyses are in fact very interesting. And um, there was one comment earlier that Brad had where he said um, that health benefits tend to be absent in the nutrition uh, benefit cost analyses. And that to me just sparked a flag in my mind for how can we as this group and how can this work lead to um, better collaboration between different types of experts. And I'm sure you're already doing that in your, in your individual work. I saw it in the papers that popped up, you know, the different authors and where they came from in their departments. Um, but how can this work really be socialized and written in a way that it directly can speak to other areas of expertise and therefore can be adopted and spread the use where appropriate of benefit cost analysis? Great, thank you. Um, I actually, uh, so um, there was a side conversation during one of the breaks. So Lynn Carolla, who's sitting in the back here, is the president of the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis. And I was um, president several years ago, and there's many board members floating around here. But uh, we were talking about how the conversation about between the BC, the people mostly do benefit cost analysis and the people mostly do cost effectiveness analysis this morning was really interesting and educational. and it's not sort of formally part of this project, but we've been brainstorming about how to continue that because I think it's a piece of what you're talking about. It's something that we really need to start breaking down that boundary and talking more about these sorts of things. What else? Um, oh, Richard's got the mic. Sorry. I have over. the mic. Then, then we'll make sure Lou gets it next. <laughs> Uh, let me make two points. Why, one to follow up to this question. Wait, one of the things when you do these stated preference surveys is that you actually have to, what the people really want to know is they want to want you to explain to them what they're going to get in terms they understand. And what's interesting here is that if you look at the, how these surveys have evolved in lots of areas, they actually get better and better over time because there's lots of interdisciplinary input. So, you know, if you do the early studies and you leave out a bunch of effects that people think are important or you get them wrong, you know, you get sort of called on and so they get, you know, they get better and they get, you also, you know, the survey designers and people who explain how this works get better at explaining to people what they're going to get. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not something that gets solved, but if you look at how the literature has evolved over time, it's a process and it seems to work. And so just the act of saying, we're going to value this, I, I always try to tell people you can get, you know, 60% of the or more of the value of doing a stated preference survey just by doing the development work before you actually even get, you know, the final answer. If you just sort of stop there, you get some ballpark idea of what the numbers are and you you find people dislike lots of things and so those are bad ideas and the other point I would make Lisa here in terms of your list I th I think what's missing is for at least a few examples or case cases I would sort of try to lay out all the sort of physical slash health effects and then rather than sort of jumping directly to valuing the non-health, whatever, yeah, valuing the non-health outcomes, I think you sort of need to delineate those. And it might be useful. There are lots of, say, early childhood programs that have, in some sense, roughly similar. They improve early childhood effects, and you can say what health and what things then sort of naturally flow from that. Uh, and then you would say, well, you know, we've got to be able to quantify those, but now we know what we need, you know, 
what we need valuation estimates from. And I think if you did that for you know a couple examples, nothing in this project is going to do it for everything. But I, th I think a couple examples would get that sort of started. Yeah, we've been talking about, I mean, I, I know all of you have seen some of these, um, and the um, uh, second panel book has an impact inventory, but um, there's a lot of checklists floating around um, for um, what to be included in benefit-cost analysis, and I think uh, um, it'd be interesting to have a piece of that be, have you thought about these different types of outcomes? And, and the second panel book takes that a few steps. I think we could take it even farther in this context. Yeah, just three, I'll try to be quick, three things, uh, pragmatism, endogeneity of the prices, and externalities. So the pragmatism is one thing that was interesting in the second panel versus the first, is they sort of reached the conclusion that, well, let's not, let's, we should put productivity as a cost in the numerator and not include it in the health state, because we've kind of figured out that people really can't think about their illness the attributes of their illness and productivity at the same time and income effects. To me, that's a very pragmatic, it's a pragmatic decision. So there's some pragmatism involved and you, and you know, so we, we should remember that. And, you know, so the, you know, the, um, let me read my notes here. So, so I, I, you know, I think that that's an issue. The other, the other issue I'm thinking about is kind of with that impact inventory, it still looks pretty static and everything we've been talking about is static, but, you know, when we're thinking about pharmaceuticals, the area I work in, especially innovative ones, these, pr whatever we're, you know, what the, like you take NICE and they say, we're going to pay 20,000 per quality and we're going to measure qualities this way, that sends signals to people about what they're going to get. So there's a dynamic side. So we're not just taking prices as ex exogenous. There's a whole function here. What we're measuring in benefit cost analysis can have long-term consequences for the investment decisions that are made. So we have to, you know, we need to worry about that. And then one of the things that was, they sort of, uh, you know, at one point I would sort of say to people, well, you know, that we, we figured it out, we should just measure qualities, that's what economic values. And then it sort of, then I sort of realized that there was an externality, there, at least in the drug side, that if a company does a trial that fails, everybody else in the industry learns from that. It wasn't a total waste from a social point of view. We're not going to pay them anything. They didn't get a product, but to that extent, you know, there's an externality of scientific information and knowledge that we need to at least think about as a limitation to what we're doing. So that's the third thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, one, one advantage of being around the benefit cost literature for a long time, and I've been around it for a long time. I think I started writing papers about benefit cost analysis before most of you were born. But uh, one of the advantages is that you, some of the stories that uh, people used to talk about or things people used to worry about are worth recalling. And one is the, uh, the, the tale about the horse and rabbit stew. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but if you have one rabbit and one horse in, in the stew, and you worry about the quality of the rabbit, it really isn't going to have that much effect because it's going to be dominated by the, by the horse, of course, in the, uh, in the stew. Well, I think there's a possible reason to, to worry about that issue here because we've been talking about all kinds of things and, uh, and worthwhile. But I come back to the thing I mentioned this morning, that uh, you know the numbers are overwhelming that we ought to be at least concerned about this issue about uh, using WTA. Now, yeah, uh, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of dispute about two things. One, that we ought to be using WTA for losses and reductions of losses. That's you know, comes out of standard theory. So we ought to agree on that. The other thing that seems hard to disagree with is that there's overwhelming evidence there's a huge difference between the two. Now, I completely agree with, with Jim that a lot of the studies have exaggerated it for the differences for all kinds of reasons, sure. But I think it's pretty hard to argue that there isn't a difference, and, then, and it's a big difference. And let me just point out sort of a different way of, of the implications of that. Um, I think it was uh, Yuri uh, uh, Stewart this morning gave us a story, remember, about uh, the meeting in which the minister, whoever it was, said, just make up some numbers. 
And we all laughed about that because, you know, how silly that is and how, you know, um, ill-advised it is. Um, many of us could tell similar stories. Uh, I certainly can, uh, where people did, you know, comparable things. But let, let's look at this for a minute. If the numbers between the WTA and WTP are sort of in the range of three, four, five, and if the if we use the WTP when we should use WTA, we're going to be off by that margin. Now, if the ran if the made up numbers that this minister was advising <laughs> making up this morning, uh, if those numbers are somewhere, they don't have to be in the ballpark, but at least in the neighborhood of sort of you know reasonable numbers, then you can sort of think about this for a minute. And if we consistently underestimate the values by using WTP as opposed to WTA, we're going to be off systematically by what, three or four, whatever the difference is. On the other hand, made up numbers are going to be completely you know, random, but within a, a certain range, presumably. It may turn out that on average, the made up numbers are going to give you better advice than the benefit cost analysis based on w the wrong measure. If that's true, and I think it probably is, is that something to worry about? I should think it is. Now, you know, one, one thing that we might do is, um, I forgot who, oh, Tommy Galvukitson this morning, I think, said something about the discount rate. Oh, by the way, the discount rate is likely also to be affected by this gain loss thing. People discount future gains at a different rate than they discount future losses. We ought to think about that as a uh, you know thing, thing to worry about in benefit cost analysis as well. Anyway, Tommy uh, mentioned this morning that we use somebody uh, was using may have been the U.S. Um, uh, O&B. I'm not sure. Anyway, three percent. If you want to use a rate for discounting other than three percent, you have to disc, you have to justify it. Well, maybe we ought to think about the implications of saying okay. If you're going to deal with something that involves losses or reductions of losses, use WTA unless you can justify WTP. You know, have that, have the default use, use the right measure. But if you want to use WTP, now the fact that all of you are using WTP all the time and are advocating using WTP, that should cause no problem. The only thing, only caveat here is that. Just because we've been doing it forever, that's not an acceptable justification. Thank you, Jack. Um, I think Tommy was next, is that right? Sure, and just for a point, just to, to follow up on that, the, that comply or justify is actually the critical difference between guidance and a, and a reference case. So the reference case can, can demand that people comply or justify, whereas guidance often just says, you know, please you know, follow this sort of good practice. But it's the justification which is the power of the reference case, which we keep in mind. But the, the, the point was, um, when developing the IDSI reference case as well, the 12th man, like the 12th principle that got discussed a bit was, was timeliness. Uh, it was right up there with, with transparency. That was key feedback decision makers were saying, the best analysis three months too late is just worthless. Um, and it was sort of go the circular argument about should we include it actually as a principle. And in the end, it, was, it sort of came through through all the, the writing and all the methodological standards, uh, specifications had that in the back of our minds. This is for low middle income country settings. There's going to be constraints in the uh, analytical and, and um, in interpretation constraints. So just the word, when we're doing these method papers and things, that has to be in, in the back of our minds that, that whatever guidance is given, what demands we're making of the analysts in the reference case, it has to keep that analytical constraint in, in mind. I think uh, the IDSI reference case, the comment was, well, could you use the reference case principles in a back of the envelope analysis. And at the end, we thought, well, probably you could. You could go through the reference case principles and say, doing a back of an envelope in a day or two, have I at least thought about all these principles? Yes. We need to apply that same test to the BCA reference case. That's a good point. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think that, uh, at least in my experience, uh, time constraints in the sense that the decision has to be made at a particular time and resource constraints, both in terms of people and dollars, are often. Um, often drive a lot of this and require thinking very carefully about what you can do with what you have. I'd like to take one more question, and then I'd like to ask the other members of our leadership team, Jim and Dean, whether they want to say any final 
words. Um, and uh, we'll just have to sort of channel David DeFranti since he's not here today and uh, see if we can imagine what he might say. Um, are you the last? <laughs> I guess every, the last one. I, I was going to comment on one thing Jack said, because I would agree with a lot of what he said about willingness to pay versus willingness to accept. But I think there's a, an important distinction here. If we were to, for instance, look at taking Obamacare away from people, that's a queer loss. I mean, this is a policy that they now have. You're going to take it away. I think a lot of these projects in developing countries where we're sort of providing clean water and it's getting rid of diarrheal diseases that these people would ordinarily get against the status quo baseline look like something that they actually have a reasonable expectation of having to pay for. And so even though the, even though actually getting the diarrheal disease is a loss relative to their status quo, I, I, think, that, I think with a lot of the policies that are actually being discussed, I don't think the Gates Foundation, in contrast to some things that governments do, I don't think the Gates Foundation is actually ever proposing doing bad things to people. And so I think this, this gets into sort of this messy sort of notion that, that comes about. You can even look at cases where, you know, you could say, what if we do clean up air pollution from power plants? Well, who has to pay the cost of the electricity? It's, it's sort of, it's a, the property rights are either nebulous or queerly willingness to pay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should probably point out that this is a, this is an issue that we've been hotly debating in the pages of the Journal Benefit Cost Analysis. And uh, I think that the, the articles might even be available for free download. You wanted to get a last word in, Jack, and then can we... Uh... Uh, no, just just a uh, implication of what Richard just uh, talking about. It's a matter of discovering what the reference point is. It's not a legal, necessarily legal. It isn't necessarily the status quo kind of thing. And we have had almost no good research on that issue because nobody has, thinks this is an issue. I think it's a huge issue. And in fact, we're actually making some progress in it. But you're right, we have to know what the reference point is before we know which measure to use. So, you know, if everybody is using WTP and, and excusing it, we're not getting any of the uh, necessary research. And that's, in fact, what's been going on. Okay, so uh, I don't know if Dean or Jim. So we wanna... do agree. <laughs> I don't know if Dean or Jim want to say any closing words. And David, I think you should get the very, very penultimate last words. Um, Dean, David. Well, obviously, I think. Uh, well, I hope everyone thinks a productive day. It certainly was uh, for me, and thank you. Um, an issue that I've faced about BCA in health. Um, since I first started looking at numbers, is that why in heaven's name would anybody believe benefit cost ratios of five or ten to one, or tripling them if we went to uh, willingness to accept? But these big benefit cost ratios seem on the face quite implausible. In some of my own work, I bordered, I hope not over the border of intellectual dishonesty, but I have um, assigned myself the task of choosing parameters that would minimize the benefit to cost ratio in the analyses I was doing. And I wouldn't f think that I got down quite where I should. So a central question I faced, and I think that I'm hearing around the room uh, more from the health side of the community, is, is there any serious plausibility to the value we're putting on mortality reduction in health-related BCA? And the compelling answer to me uh, to that question, the compelling reason or example that the answer to that question is, yes, we should place credibility, is the um, story that William Nornhaus told in uh, his look at the economic history of the United States in the 20th century. The United States' income per capita went up in real terms by a factor of six, to the extent that economic historians can measure that life expectancy went up from high 40s to close to 80. 
80 or so. Um, huge changes in both. Doing the calculations of the value of income change, including a valuation for mortality change, using methods that are broadly consistent with what we're discussing, he concluded that perhaps somewhat over half of full income change in the first half of the 20th century in the United States could be attributed to mortality reduction, and something under half, but not too much under half in the second half of the 20th century. So that's what calculations like the ones we're doing suggest that half of the welfare gain, broadly, reasonably defined. And the question he asked was, is that in any way plausible? And the way he approached thinking about that question was to ask you, ask you too, uh, if you haven't already been through this, um, which place would you rather be in? Would you rather be in a health environment like the one we have today, not only with this very long life expectancy, but with really very modest pattern of morbidity and disability along with it, but with an income level, a sixth that of today. Now, sixth that of today, adequate food, maybe outdoor plumbing, plenty of books, but obviously no movies. Um, but, you know, not really poor by today's standards, but Spartan. Or would you rather have the income you have today and a life expectancy of 48, of 48 years with an awful lot of morbidity. So those, he said, if you are having a hard time answering that question, or if you answer that question, well, I would rather actually um, have those years of life, then you're roughly buying in to the broad directions of valuation that we're talking about here. Uh, if it's pretty clear to you that you'd rather have the money, then you are rightly skeptical of the directions we're taking. So uh, it, that's been a key argument in my thinking, a key, a key example or motivation, that extreme and peculiar and unbelievable as our benefit cost analyses are, they might actually be sort of right. And it's therefore worth our sticking with it. Thank you. So I've always loved that paper by Nordhaus. I can't add anything to that. I just want to say thanks to everybody here, everybody online, everybody who wrote in in advance for your energy, your engagement, all your great suggestions. Um, so we, the, as soon they have to clean out the sort of dead space and everything on the video, and then we'll post it. But we also, um, actually I should say this to all the speakers, um, because the website is a Harvard website, I have to get permission slips from all the speakers in order to post. So um, I will be badgering you all within the next few days. Um, but it, I'm hopeful that we'll get it up within a week and uh, um, maybe we can like use some blackout or something if I don't get all the permission slips back. Um, uh, where'd David go? Oh. <laughs> Final words, and, and I did want to say, for someone who's been doing benefit cost analysis all her life, seeing all this enthusiasm and all this discussion and all these interesting points, this is like incredibly exciting. I can't tell you how wonderful it is that you're all here, um, all engaged, and uh, we hope you'll stay engaged. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Three quick points to finalize. Uh, firstly, I had uh, affirmation today that this project is worthwhile. Nobody disagreed that this uh, does not need to be done. Uh, we had rich discussion, uh, and it was uh, really, really valuable. We all have a similar, uh, similar drive that we want rational decision making uh, to be conducted uh, in, these, uh, in these settings for better health and productivity. Uh, secondly, in order to support that, um, it's wonderful that you've all been here and engaged in this process. But uh, I would like this just to be the beginning. This is, uh, this is a process that's going on for another 12 months or so. Uh, we want you to be part of it. Please submit your comments through the website. Please send uh, your, your use cases through to Lisa and to others on the team. Be involved as much as you're able and willing to. 
we're wanting you to be, we're wanting all of your input to go through uh, throughout uh, the entire process and that you will use it and that uh, you'll disseminate among your networks as well. And thirdly, I'll just echo what Jim has said and a, a big thanks to you. Thanks to everybody that was online as well. We really appreciate all the time you've taken out of your schedules to be here and to uh, just to input uh, all of this today and for those who have traveled a long way as well. We really appreciate that as well. Thank you.